This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm Carolyn Coyne. I'm a scientist in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, and I will be your sole host for this edition of That's Pediatrics for the first time. Joining me is Sylvia Ousa ansa um, uh, Sylvia specializes in pediatric emergency medicine with a subspecialty in emergency medical surf- services, which is also known as EMS. She is the director of EMS and pre-hospital care, and her interests lie in pediatric EMS research. Thank you for joining us today, Sylvia. Thank you, Dr. Quinn, for having me here, and thanks for this opportunity. Really excited to be here. So one of the things I always like to do is get a little bit more kind of background information. You know, what brought you not just to Pittsburgh, but also to emergency medicine, um, kind of a little bit of just a history of yourself. Yes, great. So uh, I was born in Boston, that town up north that's not very popular to Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, I grew up all over the country, um, secondary to my parents' job, jobs. Um, so I grew up throughout New, uh, New England, uh, in Kentucky, and most interestingly, Namibia, Southwest Africa. Oh. So my dad worked for the World Health Organization um, and was an advisor to the health minister of Namibia on HIV AIDS in the early 90s. So he really sparked my interest in health overall as he sought to make lives better for Southern Africans Mm -hmm. uh, during the height, I would say, of the HIV epidemic. Um, And I saw him going out to do predominantly education workshops. Um, And it always intrigued me, the stories that he had coming back about homeless kids who had to deal with HIV, pregnant uh, widows who had to deal with HIV, Mm -hmm. and the uphill battle of providing health care from a political standpoint. when. That wasn't everybody's first interest or priority. Um, so my interest first sparked there. And then I came back to Boston, my hometown, and after that kind of spread my wings um, to other places for higher ed- levels of education. I initially wanted to be an immunologist after being in Southern Africa and witnessing how devastating the HIV epidemic was, especially on the African continent, and then coming back home and seeing more of that in the United States, excuse mm-hmm. me, especially with patients such as Brian White. I mm-hmm. still, he left a huge imprint on me. So he was a young gentleman who was a hemophiliac who had a blood disorder, who got a blood transfusion and had HIV um, and died at a very young age as a, as a teenager, um, but lived a very impactful life in a short amount of time and had to deal with a lot of Absolutely. prejudice um, regarding the disease. So. With all of that, I decided I'm going to save the world. I'm going to become an immunologist. I'm going to cure. I'm going to be the one that cures <laughs> HIV, and I love the immune system because it, it, to me, it's like the body's army and military. And I was going to write novels about it. And um, so all of those were like initial footprints for becoming going into medicine. Um, and so when I I went to college in University of Rochester, not too far from here, and I majored in biochemistry. Uh, with the hopes of, <clears throat> excuse me, becoming an immunologist. Um, but I decided I could maybe do more uh, for, from the perspective of what I wanted to do by being a physician and doing public health work as well as clinical work. And so then what brought you to Pittsburgh? So from Boston to Pittsburgh, I'm guessing it was not the Steelers. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was not the Steelers. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say that too, you know, too loudly. Um, <laughs> But Pittsburgh is a a great town. So interestingly enough, um, I I had a long road with medicine, um, as as a lot of people do nowadays. They really try to think about what they want to do and how they want to make an impact in medicine. Um, And initially, I was a pediatrician. Then I worked in the emergency department. I decided I wanted to focus on emergency medicine. And so I went back to school to do a fellowship. So I was a general pediatrician that went back to do a fellowship to focus on how to take better care of kids. And what was it about sort of the emergency medicine aspect of it? Was the ability, was it the ability to sort of be on the front line for, for care for children? Or was there something in particular? Yes, it was the ability to be yeah. on the front line mm-hmm. and play detective yeah. right then and there. And even fix things, fix certain aspects of, of things right away mm-hmm. and not kind of have to wait and see the progression and, and to witness the, you know, excitement on parents' faces when, you know, 
a broken arm was fixed within a few hours and their kid was jumping around or feeling better um, or just having to scratch my head real hard about a particular patient that came in with fever and a rash that had recently traveled wasn't quite sure what was going on with that patient Mm -hmm. Um, so all of those things and also from a personal standpoint I've always wanted to have a family I knew that and emergency medicine gives you the ability the flexibility to be home you know during the weekdays uh, in the afternoons to watch your kids play their softball game or take your kids to gymnastics Mm -hmm. and I like that flexibility very nice so one of the things I mentioned was that you were the director of EMS. So, and, and that's not something I'm familiar with. And, and perhaps for the listeners out there who are also not familiar, could you tell us a little bit about what that is? Right. So EMS is stands for Emergency Medical Services. It's what we know as 911, oh. but it's actually greater than that. So we, you know, as as individuals, we see we know EMS to be you call 911. You have an ambulance show up and a paramedic come take care of you and transport you, whether you're at home or on the road or where ha- wherever that may be. Mm-hmm. But EMS is a huge health system within itself that has um, people that take care of you, known as EMTs and paramedics. It may be combined with the fire department, so mm-hmm. maybe combined with firefighters who are also paramedics or EMTs that do the medical side of things. Um, it involves dispatch, which are the group of folks that take care of the phone calls when you call 911, um, and a ho- it, it has a public health aspect to it. And if there's a disaster in the area, it's the EMS systems that are responsible for responding for things like Hurricane Katrina, um, for you know any kind of disaster preparedness, things like 911, 9-11, excuse me, um, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Mm-hmm. So EMS is involved in the width and breadth of all of those things. And so your role as director is to keep all of those parts moving smoothly. <laughs> yes, to keep all those parts moving job. smoothly. <laughs> Thank you. But even more importantly, to not lose the focus on the children. Mm-hmm. Um, so my job is to make sure that the folks who take care of kids in the EMS system know how to take care of them, feel comfortable in taking care of them, and know the latest standard of care or the latest um, means of medically taking care of them so that they provide the utmost best care outside of the hospital as we aim to do inside of the hospital. And is that because, again, as as sort of a non-clinician perhaps, um, I think sometimes there's this assumption that a child is is nothing more than just a smaller adult, right? And and everything works the same and everything should be the same. And so I guess having said that, what are the specific challenges within EMS, either if it's just a 911 call or even a greater sort of level of an emergency, of taking care of a child versus if this were just an adult-only type situation? Right, so that's a great question. And um, I get asked that quite a bit. So one is that there's the frequency of a child being transported to the hospital is very low. So only 10% of kids get transported via EMS. So that leaves us with 90% of EMS transports are adults. So a lot of these folks don't see kids that often. Mm -hmm. And usually when they do, so we call it low frequency, high acuity. So usually when the child is transported, a lot of times they're very, very sick, which can be very, very scary Mm -hmm. because they're their children and, and people think about their own children or their nephews and nieces or whomever when they're taking care of them. So mm-hmm. it can be extremely scary. And so, yes, you bring up a good point um, that a lot of times we think of children as little adults, mm-hmm. but in essence, they're really not. Um, they're built differently. So we, their anatomy, the way they work on the inside is markedly different. And you can, if you think about it, you can imagine a baby is very different than an adult. Oh, yeah. So you have to, there are certain ways that you have to take care uh, of those children. There are certain types of medications, for instance. Uh, sorry, so medication delivery is different. So for instance, for kids, mm-hmm. we weight base dose kids. What does that mean? So for every kid that needs medication, we need to know their weight, mm-hmm. and we have to calculate their medication based on weight. Whereas an adult, there's usually a standard one or two doses that we use for each medication. Mm -hmm. So that in itself could bring about or allow for uh, significant errors in what we call medication dosing. Mm -hmm. Also, the build of a child is a little bit different. Little children have bigger heads, smaller necks, bigger bellies. So in the case of, for instance, trauma, like in a motor vehicle collision, um, considerations and 
focuses of care are different when taking care of a kid mm -hmm. that you pull out of a motor vehicle collision than an adult. So, so there's certain areas of the body that you need to focus on um, more readily, more quickly than you would on an adult. And so is, is part of then your role just educating the, the physicians that are on, again, the front line of maybe the local emergency room, not here at the Children's Hospital, where obviously there's going to be an appreciation for, you know, infants and children and, and their needs. So is it going out there to make sure that those sort of providers understand these rules and regulations? Yes. Yeah, so that is a good part of what I do yeah. is outreach. Um, since I've been here at Children's uh, UPMC Children's of Pittsburgh, uh, I've gone as far as Mannheim, PA. I've gone up to Erie, mm -hmm. uh, Johnstown, Uniontown. So throughout the western Pennsylvania area, even to central eastern Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. educating uh, EMS agencies. Um, now, throughout the U United States, there are numerous EMS agencies from rural to urban, um, and some of them work a little bit differently. So a lot of times, yeah, if you want to educate folks, you'll have to go to them mm -hmm. as opposed to them uh, coming to you, which which I enjoy. And I, and I you know, uh, EMS personnel that I've met and staff are so eager to learn um, for the sake of healthcare, um, and so it's it's really an honor to to teach those ladies and gentlemen that are out there day and day day in and day out taking care care of us um, outside of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I know, and this just switched gears at least sort of slightly, is I know one of your research focuses, um, in addition to, to sort of all the EMS work that you do, is looking at conditions of children when they come into the emergency room. And I know one of the things that, that you've, in the last year in particular, really focused on is acute flaccid myelitis, AFM, which is something that, for the for listeners out there, we've had a dedicated podcast to. Um, and so if you would you give us a little bit of background and your sort of the research that you've done in this and kind of what piqued your interest in this as a condition? Yes, yeah, so part of what I, I really want to emphasize for myself is that um, to holistically take care of a patient, um, I think you need to know what's going on clinically, but I think you also need to know the evidence behind what you're doing clinically. So it's a, the reason why I bring up all that is because I had one of the first, I actually had the first three patients that presented to UPMC Children's Hospital Pittsburgh with AFM and I didn't know what it was. Wow. Um, and so I based my knowledge based on um, the types of diseases that I thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, one of the children I kept in the hospital because they were sick enough to keep in the hospital. Um, but another child, I will admittedly say, I sent home because I, I really didn't know what was going on mm -hmm. with them and they didn't really fit into my box of diagnoses. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked that child up extensively, nothing came of it. The child got a little bit better, but then came back. Mm -hmm. So then that gave me even more impetus to find out when, what's really going on or what is this disease process, mm -hmm. which led me to learning a little bit more about AFM. Mm -hmm. So AFM um, in the media has been described as um, non-polio, and I want to emphasize that, non-polio, <laughs> like uh, paralysis uh, in which children, which sorry, is transferred uh, via a few different types of viruses, um, predominantly, so far that we know, enterovirus, Coxsackie virus, mm -hmm. or specific strains. Um, it tends to um, come more in the late summer, early fall. We're seeing uh, kind of the patterns of that. Um, every other year, we're seeing surges and peaks as opposed to every year. Um, we're still not quite sure why and what the actual main source is outside of the viral uh, uh, transmission. Mm -hmm. From a clinical standpoint, patients present um, with, usually with, they can present with a limp, um, they can present looking very sick and tired and what we call lethargic. Um, but the one of the classic findings that we find when we examine a child is that they have no reflexes. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean? So usually when we examine children, we check to see if their nerves are working properly. And as many people probably remember going to the doctor's office, doctors usually put a hammer to your knee and your knee just jerks upward very quickly and we call that a reflex. So that's the nerve responding um, to the hammer. Um, so Children with AFM do not have that response. When you put the hammer to the knee or, or to, the, to the heel, they lack what we call reflexes. Um, so that's one of the significant signs that we see. Um, in addition to that, 
a lot of the symptoms are not very specific. They may come with flu-like illness or cold-like illness before, but the key is usually these, these children complain of um, trouble walking to some degree, limping, and to confirm the diagnosis, they need what's called an MRI, um, in which that is a, it's a type of imaging that we do, that we, we're able to see not only bones like in x-rays, um, or s specific matter like in a CAT scan, but we can see the details of tendons and nerves such as the spinal cord. Um, and certain patterns on the MRI let us know, along with the clinical diagnosis, that this child likely has uh, acute flaccid myelitis, mm -hmm. which is also known as AFM. And so is some of your interest then just getting out better definitions then, presumably, for providers so that if a patient, child in particular, of course, which is obviously where AFM usually seems to be uh, most dramatic, mm -hmm. um, is to educate them on, so if they have a child that comes into the ER, you can say, you know, X, Y, and Z, we think this this is a suspected case of AFM. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Um, and in essence, to, to bring about um, a better outcome from what I learned mm -hmm. having having missed that diagnosis yeah. by not being aware of the diagnosis. And so not only do we want to let other physicians know out in the community or even in uh, academic centers, mm -hmm. but again, like with my EMS work, inform the paramedics, any, any healthcare provider, school nurses, any healthcare provider that may yeah. come across these kids before they yeah. uh, enter the hospital. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Sylvia. I learned a lot. Well, thank you for having me. This was uh, an enjoyable time.